Welcome everybody. As the uh, virtual gala room uh, comes in, um, this is the second Corporate Nights uh, virtual gala and executive roundtable. And we'll see what next year holds. Please get your uh, virtual quarantinis out. Um, uh, even if, if even if it's in the morning where you are, where, um, uh, in, in as it is in in, uh, in much of Canada at the moment. Welcome to the Corporate Nights Best Fifty Corporate Citizens uh, Virtual Gala Executive Roundtable uh, with event sponsor Bullfrog Power. We'll get started in a moment. And if you like, um, at uh, at an in-person gala, we would be uh, dropping our names, our business cards, catching up in the chat. So please feel free to use the chat box uh, or the Q&A um, box to uh, introduce yourself. Um, uh, we will be having a, a Q&A that you'll be able to participate in as, as well with our panel in a little bit. And welcome. Uh, my name's uh, Kareem Bardizi. I'm a board member of Corporate Knights uh, and also the executive director and co-founder of the Ryerson Leadership Lab at Ryerson University. Thanks to everyone for joining us on this special occasion and special thanks to Bullfrog Power again for sponsoring our virtual gala. Uh, Toby Heaps, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Corporate Knights is not able to be with us here today. Um, we're dedicating this uh, Best 50, the 20th Best 50 uh, to him as the co-founder of Corporate Knights. We hope to have him back with us again soon. Um, this is um, this project and the larger project of uh, clean capitalism, the larger project of um, using the power of capital uh, to find solutions to some of our most pressing public challenges um, is one that uh, Toby has been on the front lines of uh, for years. Uh, many of you will have had, will have relationships with him and know how, um, how insistent he is, how farsighted he is, um, and how um, full of the moral sense of what we need to do he is. And it's wonderful that, um, through him and through the work of Corporate Knights uh, entering its 20th year, we're able to uh, gather um, uh, on June 30th, the time of um, a reflection around the, the, about Canada and what Canada's uh, moral commitments are. And on a day when the moral commitments um, that we need to make uh, uh, and businesses role in that is never more clear as we recover from the devastating effects of the, uh, the heat wave that's hit um, uh, Western Canada and will, is, is moving its way east uh, already, as we know, with uh, dozens of deaths uh, tragically uh, in the lower mainland of British Columbia. Um, but this is a day also of celebration of marking those corporate champions, those companies, those entities that are really on the front lines of change making. Um, and we celebrate today the summer edition of Corporate Nights, which is out today. It's in your Globe and Mail. Um, here's, the, here's, the, uh, here's the cover and today, we're going to be celebrating the best 50 corporate citizens in Canada ranking, including Globe, included in the Globe and Mail for subscribers. Um, and the full list is available on uh, corporatenights.com um, and is live now. Uh, we've got a busy agenda today with a, a video to get us uh, started to set the scene uh, for this work. Um, uh, and then a conversation with um, uh, David Murray from uh, Hydro Quebec, a panel fe featuring um, uh, representatives from some of our top 50 companies. Uh, uh, conversation with Tom Dowdle, uh, uh, business ambition lead for the 1.5 um, um, campaign at the Climate Disclosure Project, and closing at noon. So we'll go a bit past noon because we've got uh, uh, Minister Jean-Yves Duclos uh, joining us uh, uh, exactly at noon Eastern time uh, for some closing remarks. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, start with uh, the video that kind of sets the scene for where we are, um, where we've been the last 20 years, In 2002, there was no Paris Agreement. There was little in the way of sustainable investing, few protocols for measuring businesses' social and environmental impacts, and no Greta Thunberg. That year, I founded Corporate Knights with Paul Fangler and Peter Depleros. In our first editor's note, we wrote that corporations don't exist in a vacuum. We as citizens are their lifeblood. We coined the term clean capitalism. We believed that corporations could be incubators for human progress and wealth creation, envisioning an economic system that incorporates the full social, economic, and ecological costs and benefits of our marketplace actions. We formed a committee to design the first annual ranking of Canada's most sustainable businesses. 
called The Best 50 Corporate Citizens. This year marks our 20th edition of The Best 50. A lot's happened in sustainability since we started, so let's rewind. The new millennium kicked off with the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which aimed to cut extreme poverty in half by 2015. In 2001, the UN Global Compact was founded based on 10 principles designed to harness the power of business as a force for good. Two years later, 70,000 people died in a record heat waves across Europe, where temperatures soared to high 30s and alpine glaciers shrank by 10%. In 2005, the Kyoto Protocol came into force. The United Nations launched six aspirational principles for responsible investment. Under the auspices of a new body, the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. With the decade more than half over, the Stern Review published the economics of climate change, highlighting the economic logic for swift and bold international response to the climate crisis. In 2007, Gore's film An Inconvenient Truth brought climate science to the masses and won an Oscar for Best Documentary. When U.S. financial markets collapsed, causing the biggest global recession since the Great Depression, which put the financial sector under a microscope and environmental considerations on the back burner. Closing the decade, UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon visited the polar ice rim to observe the impact of climate change on icebergs and glaciers. He reported the loss of glaciers at 150 billion tons per year. If there was any doubt about the hazards of fossil fuels, the 2010 explosion of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig was a wake-up call. Over 200 million gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico, devastating the coastal environment and killing 11 people. In 2011, Occupy Wall Street converged into Lower Manhattan, sparking a global movement to protest the financial sector. Then, another sign of the mounting climate crisis. In Hawaii, daily average atmospheric carbon dioxide was recorded, for the first time in 55 years of measuring, at over 400 parts per million. The safe level, according to scientists, is 350 parts per million. Despite the bad news, clean capitalism continued gaining momentum. The United Nations launched the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement set a global goal of limiting warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. In 2019, Canadians told pollsters that climate change was one of the top three most important issues in determining how they would vote in the federal election. The pandemic triggered another recession in 2020, and this time sustainability issues weren't relegated to the back burner. Around the world, global businesses doubled down on green growth, and superpowers tabled historic budgets for green recovery, including more than half a trillion euros to decarbonize Europe by 2050, and a $2 trillion US plan that aims to get carbon out of the electricity sector by 2035. As world leaders make bold commitments to do better, we know that Canada has to step up too. From our first issue of Corporate Nights, we've been grading Canada's largest corporations, raising flags, and illuminating solutions. They've come a long way since 2002, and capitalism is looking cleaner with each year. To make the best 50, a company is rated using 24 key performance indicators, like how much money is earned from planet-friendly activities, how diverse is the company leadership, how much taxes does the company pay. By focusing on the things that matter, we show that companies can do well while doing good. We'd like you to meet them. Corporate Nights proudly presents the 2021 Best 50 Corporate Citizens in Canada and the Top 10 International Corporate Citizens.
The pandemic has brought many lessons home, emphasizing that we may all be in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. To fix this, we need to join the clean economy and the fair economy at the hip in a way that unleashes the power of business as a force for good. How do we get there? While making good on Canada's commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050? By closing the gap between saying and doing, by banning the really harmful stuff and pouring money into the good stuff, by combining institutions and science into an era of action, by locking in change. To crystallize this era of action, we urge all Best 50 companies to sign and honor bold climate commitments. In 2002, we wrote, we live in a world that is closing the gap between action and meaning. Now that sustainable solutions are growing faster than problems, the economic scales have tipped in our favor. With the combined actions of corporate citizens and everyday citizens, we can close the gap for good. Thank you, uh, Chris and Eric, for that video. And uh, you heard Toby's voice in the video. You also heard uh, Jasmine Albardizzi's voice here representing the next generation of uh, climate leadership. And there she goes after taking her bow. Um, a little story about Jasmine. Uh, when she was baptized in the uh, Anglican church, she was, uh, um, uh, it, was the, it was the week after the Anglican church had revised its um, baptismal rights to include uh, a commitment to protect the earth. Um, and so uh, I guess institutions, even the, even the oldest institutions are changing in ways that uh, uh, are, are gonna be helping to tackle the challenge. Um, uh, thanks so much um, um, uh, to all the companies recognized in that video. And you saw, of course, uh, or you heard the Bullfrog Power um, um, uh, gribbets whenever there was a company there that uses the Bullfrog uh, technology. Um, very happy now to be joined by uh, the top company on the best 50 list, Hydro-Québec. Uh, which also took the top spot in 2018. And we're joined today by uh, David Murray, Chief and Innovation Officer of Ithro Quebec, as, long, as well as a, a number of other uh, roles at the company. Uh, and we thank you for joining us. Uh, congratulations on, on this achievement. And we'd love to hear a few words from you. Thank you, Karim. Uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone. So Ithro Quebec is proud and honored uh, to be listed as number one corporate night uh, 2021 and best 50 corporate citizens uh, in Canada report. Um, I'd like to thank uh, thank you uh, to Corporate Knights for acknowledging our organization uh, and actually also uh, the 49 other companies who are also making uh, huge efforts uh, to have a, a positive impact, especially when we think about what's happening live, uh, either in BC or in Quebec where we have tornado, I guess our responsibility is more uh, growing bigger and bigger every day. I also want to say thank you to all our Hydro Quebec's employees uh, who actively contributes to furthering sustainability. Uh, the company's number one ranking is an evidence of well-established business culture uh, that puts environmental, social, and economic issues uh, front and center. Uh, Hydro Quebec's current goals are driven in by its 2024 Sustainable Development Plan, uh, which includes three pillars, uh, governance, community, and environment. But also uh, the plan lays out 12 strategies uh, linked to specific improvement uh, targets uh, and, and performance indicators. Uh, Hydro-Quebec is also a target of carbon neutrality uh, across its operation by uh, 2030. Uh, a few examples of um, uh, why we've been uh, uh, successful uh, and uh, we, we keep you know, pushing the bar because I, I think there's always ways to improve. Uh, number one, our clean investments. So Hydro-Quebec aims at, uh, for clean energy investments. Obviously, we mostly do hydro. Uh, but we uh, we also invest in the other renewable energy source. Uh, uh, we have 4,000 megawatts of wind. Uh, we just uh, 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 instituted our solar first uh, solar park uh, two weeks ago. Um, and and uh, in the future, obviously, decarbonization like uh, green hydrogen is going to be key. We have announced one of the biggest hydrogen uh, electrolyzer uh, that's going to help produce uh, biofuel. Uh, also, something that we're doing is to reduce consumption. So through our innovation. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, minimize the consumption of energy with a uh, sub subsidiary company like ILO that uh, we've launched, which is the best way for everybody to be uh, 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 optimal in the way we're, consume, uh, we're consuming the energy. Second aspect is working on diversity uh, and parity for us. So uh, uh, with our CEO and uh, management team, there's a strong push uh, for us in diversity and, and parity. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, we're, uh, we're quite aggressive, uh, which we have 
uh, five different committees pushing uh, the, the parity and, and the diversity to, uh, towards the company. And at the governance level, uh, this is uh, something that's uh, been, uh, that is being looked at on a day-to-day -day basis. And also more indigenous uh, people uh, that are working with us. We have, uh, Hydro Quebec has 1,100 projects going on a yearly basis, and we're uh, working uh, hands in hands with the ind indigenous people and, and also uh, increase the number of indigenous uh, people into our ranks also. And finally, uh, obviously, uh, having uh, trying to have smart uh, smart decision, the dream of every uh, leader. But every decision we make, we uh, we take is balanced between several filters. Obviously, uh, the ESG filter is right up in center in our discussion uh, on uh, on our strategic discussion. And uh, Hydro Quebec uh, is is making these choices, but also putting in the focus our customers. We cannot forget our customers at the end. So uh, thanks again uh, for this uh, recognition. We're really grateful and uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep uh, pushing the, the, the boundaries for, uh, for the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, thanks, uh, congratulations to Hitoru Quebec. You hit on a number of uh, things that really show the full range of the considerations uh, that the best uh, 50 corporate citizens ranking uh, takes in. Uh, obviously a key focus on sustainability and uh, carbon neutrality, uh, but not just um, not just any form of carbon neutrality through uh, a real sense that the revenues of the company um, are really being driven more and more by um, by low carbon sources. And so that's why one of the data points on the uh, on the best uh, 50 corporate rankings isn't just isn't just um, a, a carbon a carbon measure, but it's the revenue uh, revenue sales per per ton of uh, of, uh, of carbon uh, emitted. And you referred to a number of other issues that we know now are really key to good citizenship, good sustain, uh, sustainability, and really um, showing the corporation in its fullest way being part of the pro uh, part of the solution and not part of the problem. Uh, references there by David to, uh, to, uh, to to diversity, to inclusion initiatives, and uh, those are uh, in various ways a very uh, key part of the corporate citizen uh, met metric as well. Um, We've now got a panel here with uh, joined by leaders from some some of the best 50 companies representing a range of sectors uh, and also just I'll just introduce them in turn. Um, from uh, tech resources we've got Marcia Smith, Senior Vice President of Sustainability and External Affairs. From Van City we've got Nez, uh, Nez uh, Aquino, Chief Risk Officer. From BASF Canada, we've got uh, the, the CEO, Apala Mukherjee. From HSBC Canada, we've got the head of co corporate sustainability, Kim Hallwood. And from Toronto Hydro, we've got uh, Ave Lethbridge, executive vice president and chief, chief human resources and safety officer. Welcome to all of you, uh, and thank you for uh, your participation in this panel. Per thank you for your leadership role and your very specific leadership role within or at the head of your companies uh, on uh, on uh, initiatives that relate to corporate citizenship, uh, or more broadly, uh, driving uh, these key ideas around sustainability in your company as a whole. And I'm um, glad to see the intros continuing to come into the uh, chat box. Please, uh, please keep uh, um, uh, invite our gala attendees to continue to. Uh, introduce themselves uh, in the chat box. So I'm going to start maybe with a, the big question around uh, the big existential question, I guess you might say, around, around sustainability and climate, uh, which is the need to get to, to net zero. Um, uh, we've got the world as it is, and the world that uh, we know needs, uh, the world that we know we need to get to. Um, Toby in his video referred to Greta Thunberg, and she popularized the notion of a carbon budget, and we only have uh, so much, so many more years of uh, emitting carbon at the current uh, rate before we exceed the UN targets. And so each of the companies here has a role um, in, um, in uh, helping to get to net zero. Uh, and uh, some of those companies may actually have uh, specific net zero plans in their own, in their own worlds. Um, but it's not easy. We've got the world as it is. We've got the sales um, uh, channel as it is. We've got the existing clients as they are. Um, so I want to start with a question around that, and maybe start with uh, uh, start with Marcia Smith uh, from Tech Resources. Why is achieving net zero emissions um, so important, <laughs> and what are what are the challenges uh, to get there? Uh, great. Well, thank you, Karim. And um, I just will start maybe by saying thank you to Corporate Knights 
it really means a lot to us at Tech to be recognized this way. And uh, we're certainly very honored to be included um, in this incredible group of companies. And uh, I'd just like to take a moment to congratulate each of the best 50 corporate citizens uh, for this accomplishment. And I, I think we probably all share very similar goals. Um, you know, we all are looking to help improve the quality of life for people uh, here in Canada and around the globe. And we all want to be responsible corporate citizens, uh, working um, certainly at tech to continuously improve our environmental, social, and governance performance. And so why is, is net zero so critical uh, to us? Um, well, I, I would say, I think, Karim, you know, as you've said, uh, and certainly talking to you this morning from Vancouver, in the middle of a, a really unprecedented heat wave, uh, I think we, we all know that we need to take meaningful action if we're going to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees um, as, as committed to in the Paris Climate Agreement. And I think we all recognize that um, it's going to take action from, uh, from all sectors and across all jurisdictions. And you know, here at Tech, we've had uh, climate um, carbon reduction goals uh, in place for over a decade. And today we are working on the pathway to being net zero by 2050. And certainly net zero is, um, <clears throat> it's a very big goal for us. Um, and it is not without its challenges, but I am pleased to say that we are making progress uh, towards that goal. And uh, you know, how we think about it, um, we are today one of the lowest um, uh, scope one, scope two um, producers of, of our products in the world. Um, but we do have um, we do have a, a journey ahead of us, and as I said, happy to to talk this morning about what some of those challenges are um, as we work through um, our pathway to net zero. Yeah, maybe just maybe just invite us into the into the room a little bit on uh, um, on one of the biggest challenges you you face, and uh, especially given the competing uh, <laughs> competing needs for capital um, within the company. What would it, what would it, what would one of the big challenges be for tech right now in, the, in this regard? Well, I, I think two things. Um, one, like certainly here in Canada, our operations um, in British Columbia, we already start from a, a you know a place of having clean renewable power. Uh, that's one of the benefits of being um, here in this province. But in other jurisdictions, for example, in Chile, um, you know, we did not have uh, the benefit of clean renewable power. We have moved now to procure 100% of our power needs from Chile from renewables by 2030. So we have made those commitments and, and, and we're underway there. Um, the other biggest source of, of um, carbon for us, of course, comes from our mining equipment. And today um, we do not have, there is not technology in place uh, today that allows us to decarbonize some of that equipment. So there is work going on globally um, to, with, with equipment providers to look at how do we turn our equipment into, um, into electric vehicles or, or use you know, cleaner technology, cleaner fuels than diesel. But as of today, that doesn't exist. So that is our challenge, is working to get the, um, the equipment in place, the technology in place that allows us to fully decarbonize. Thank you for inviting us into um, the kinds of decisions you're, you're facing, uh, Marcia. Maybe we'll get to a financial institution's perspective now, which is a very different uh, set of considerations. Um, it's probably more of a balance sheet um, uh, and lending portfolio perspective. Um, and well, for that, I'd love to hear from uh, uh, love to hear from uh, uh, Nays from Van City. Uh, biggest challenge that you're facing um, in this in this space right now. Yeah, thanks, Kareem. And I would also like to start by uh, thanking Corporate Knights for our, the recognition again uh, for Van City being the best corporate citizen. And congratulations to all the fifty recipients today. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, for a financial institution, I think the challenges are actually quite industry specific. So maybe I'll speak on behalf of uh, financial institutions. And Kim, I'm sure you have some comments on that too from, from HSBC. Uh, it is very much about the consistent application, understanding of data. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you think about how financial institutions have evolved over hundreds of years. Uh, it's been about, you know, talking everything in, in terms of dollars and cents. And now we're trying to convert all of that into a new language. And the unit of measurement is carbon, carbon emission is a new unit of, it's a new currency. So um, uh, I am very optimistic actually about the path we're on. Uh, very pleased to see the regulator getting very close to the space, OSFI, in partnership with Bank of Canada in, in doing really good work to um, kind of normalize and create consistent uh, formal reporting uh, disclosure. Um, we have uh, taken our own steps for the last two years. We have consistently reported our carbon uh, emission 
based on the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financial, which is an organization uh, represented by more than 100 organizations around the world, uh, mostly from Europe uh, and some from US, and there's definitely representation in Canada. Uh, but there's a Herculean effort in front of every organization to get this right. But I am optimistic at, the, at this pivotal moment we're in. But if there was one challenge, I would say it's a consistency of data and understanding the data uh, in how we approach the problem. Yeah, and you just mentioned an institution there, uh, Nez, that um, is uh, really important in the space, but maybe not as well known, and it's going to be much more important, OSFI. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe Nez and, uh, and Kim, just um, what, is, what is OSFI? Why, why should we care? <laughs> <laughs> um, and what, and what, would an, what would a financial institution uh, be doing and what should they be doing to harmonize, uh, harmonize standards? So OSFI stands for Office of the Superintendent for Financial Institutions, and it is a regulator for financial institutions in Canada. And uh, I, I, I think it's important for the... So when we look at the problem, because the problem is so big, nobody can solve this problem alone, right? It requires very strong partnership from the regulator, from all levels of the government, as well as the organizations. And I think uh, it's important to think about a regulator in the space when they need to, they play a role in coming to the field and um, creating some requirements for how we report, how we talk about carbon emission, just like we have requirements on how we talk about capital and deposits and loans. It's a new language that needs to be created, formulated and regulated so that there's consistency among all financial institutions to report the same way, to think about this in the same way. Otherwise, we get very lost in the diversity of the language and measurement, uh, and it doesn't really produce the outcomes we need. Thank you very much, Nays. And maybe, Kim, I'll, I'll just stay on the financial institutions track a bit. Um, and and, you, and you've, got a, you've got a role uh, head of corporate sustainability. And I suspect, just seeing from some of the intros here, uh, perhaps you speak uh, on behalf of, of the other corporate sustainability leads uh, within organizations. So talk to us about what what that role is like and what what uh, you're trying to do within your organization to drive towards uh, towards net zero and what the challenges are, perhaps as someone who's working within an organization that has lots of uh, competing uh, uh, priorities. Yeah, happy to. And and let me start uh, by saying thank you and, and happy anniversary to Corporate Knights. Uh, HSBC is honored to have been included in your ranking for the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, congratulations to all the best 50 and the top international companies that are being celebrated today. HSBC's own anniversary, our 40th anniversary is actually uh, tomorrow in Canada. And we're so proud to be recognized for the work that we're do doing to build our business for the long term and, and create value for our stakeholders. Uh, in terms of you know what HSBC is doing, um, some of you may be aware, uh, last year HSBC announced a renewed climate ambition, uh, which includes a, an ambition to become a net zero bank, and that builds on the previous am ambitions and commitments that we put forth in 2017. Um, for us, that represented a significant increase in our ambition level. Uh, it was a quite quite a bold statement at the time when not a lot of other corporates were coming out with, with net zero statements, and I think that reflects both the urgency of climate change and the growing expectation of our stakeholders. Um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time right now around sustainable finance and, and our climate commitments. And those are really focused on, on three pillars. Uh, the first is around becoming a net zero bank, both in our own operations by 2030 and through our finance emissions by 2050. So for our own our operational emissions, this for us is quite straightforward. We, we know how to do this. It's one of the reasons why we've been on the corporate nights ranking for, for 10 years now. Uh, but for our finance, that submissions it this is where it becomes more complicated uh, to Nez's point around data. Uh, so we're investing in tools and collaborating with others like the uh, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, PCAF, uh, as well as PACTA, uh, to, to figure out you know, how do we step forward a transition pathway for our finance emissions. Uh, and then that leads to the second pillar of our strategy, which is really around supporting our customers in all industries on their unique journey to net zero. Uh, that looks very different for every company and, and every industry. So to do that, we're looking to provide between $750 billion uh, and $1 trillion in finance and investment over the next 10 years, quite a big number that uh, we're also working to offer our customer, 
customers innovative sustainable finance uh, products and solutions. So for example, uh, we were recently selected as one of the structuring advisors on the Government of Canada's inaugural issuance of green bonds. Uh, and last year we completed Canada's first green loan for a commercial client. And then, then lastly, we're, we're looking at unlocking new climate solutions. And we're doing that by investing in nature-based solutions, mainly through our asset management arm. Uh, and we also launched a $100 million philanthropic program, which is focused on scaling climate innovation. Uh, and in Canada, that's being deployed through a partnership with Mars Clean Tech, uh, which is really focused on accelerating the adoption of clean technology. So there's there's a lot underway. Uh, I think the, the big thing for us and the big focus over the next while is really around how we support and and engage our clients on net zero. Uh, you know, while we announced that ambition to be a net zero bank last fall, it's really important that we we pair that ambition with uh, action and with a credible plan. So, uh, you know. I believe uh, Net uh, Van City is also a founding member of the Net Zero Banking Alliance uh, that we committed to and were a founding member of earlier this year. And so we're working on setting clear science-based strategy with short and medium term targets to align our finance emissions. And, and so important, Kim, at a time when uh, a lot of institutions are reacting to things that they're seeing uh, in the news or hearing from their constituents. Um, but sometimes the credibility of the plan isn't there and sometimes the data informed approaches aren't there and sometimes the collaboration isn't there. And again, I will just, uh, if you want to know about the data, uh, a reminder to pick up uh, uh, today's issue of Corporate Nights in your Globe and Mail and uh, page 32 is where the scorecard is and you can see the, the data points uh, there. Uh, there's still a beauty in print and uh, this is one of the most, um, uh, this is one of the nicest uh, issues uh, to date of Corporate Nights with some, uh, some, uh, ever, uh, some, some high quality paper. Uh, there, um, uh, just a couple. One thing I want to pick up on there, Kim. You, you, you just. I think you spoke to the breadth of activities that's required in, within a within a firm uh, to get to 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 make these uh, um, to get to these uh, ambitious targets. Um, just talk to us about um, what it's like. You know, uh, trying to orchestrate this within within a large multinational firm, and uh, what kind of role that you play in 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 driving that change and the challenges you might face. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think a lot of our our role right now is because there's so much happening in the external environment, and and the pace of change is so significant. It's being able to take that in and and make sense of it for the organization, and kind of be that sense maker and in. in uh, chief sense maker, connector of the dot. So, you know, we spend a lot of our time, my team, making sure that, you know, what we do from an ESG perspective is really embedded within the organization. It's not our role as a corporate sustainability team, it's everyone's role. So we spend a lot of time advising, supporting, influencing, and ensuring that we're keeping up with the pace that we see externally. Uh, I think, you know, it's really important that we as an organization see the tone coming from the top. Uh, and we've certainly seen that at HSBC see last year, uh, we included the transition to net zero as one of our top four global priorities. It's a priority for, of our CEO here in Canada as well. So really important to have, have that tone from the top. Uh, but it, I think in terms of the challenges, it, it is really uh, in, you know, how do we work with our, our clients to make sure that this is a just transition, that we are supporting them throughout the transition, regardless of what sector that they operate in. Um, for, for some of our clients, you know, they're very well established in sustainability for others they are earlier on their journey so it's understanding where to meet them um, and and help them along that way and and again you know we're seeing a lot of commitment from our clients we're seeing you know before it was we had to convince them of the why now they're asking okay how do we do this? So it, it, it's, you know, working with them um, to explain what we're doing around net zero and hopefully encourage them to, to take a similar path. And so, uh, uh, we've got some questions coming in at the Q&A and it sounds like you anticipated Miles Coffin's question around uh, what do the clients express initiative or do you proactively encourage them? And it sounds like uh, there's a bit of both there happening. Exactly. Um, Kim, Kim, you mentioned the, the, the view from the top and the, the, the leadership driving from the very top of the organization. And um, uh, so I want to bring in uh, Apollo Mukherjee now from, from BASF Canada, uh, both uh, from a CEO perspective, but also from a, a manufacturing perspective. Uh, talk to us about, your, uh, about BASF Canada's um, uh, journey and commitment and the challenges that you're facing. Sure, thanks. And uh, thank you, Kareem, for having me in the panel. And thank you to Corporate Knights for this recognition. And also from my side, congratulations to all the winners. Karim, you said it right, that the climate change is an existential threat. 
uh, for human beings. Yeah, and I think that's what we also feel in BSF that the need for bold, immediate actions is a must do now. So the climate scientists have been saying that the, one of the primary ways to avoid this dangerous climate change is to abate the emissions. And uh, governments and companies are setting ambitious targets to achieve this net zero and BSF as a global chemical company is no exception. So we have set ourselves a target of achieving net zero by 2050. And we set that target March of this year. Moreover, based on the, some of the recent progresses we see in the, in the innovation and the low emission and the carbon free technologies, we have actually committed to achieving CO2 reduction by 25% by 2030 comes at a price tag of 4 billion euros or 6 billion Canadian within 2030. So we, um, a lot of these innovations can happen inside of BSF and we are trying to do as many as we can, but we know that this large scale transformative innovation and investment partnership is required. Yeah. So Canada is in a great position to lead this reduction of emissions. And we can really demonstrate the commitment. So I'm really encouraged to hear all these Canadian business community present here at the ceremony to really double down their efforts in addressing this impact of climate change and speeding up the transition. One of the challenges we face in a manufacturing space that everybody is trying to, is focused on optimizing their own piece of the operations. While that is absolutely critical, it's important to understand the entire value chain. So you need to look at the supplier and the customer area. That means we need to have deeper collaboration and transparency between the stakeholders, and that's vital to achieving net zero. Additional challenge that we face is that the capital deployed needs to have a sustainability and a net zero as a criteria. And we need to ensure that that's actually a key criteria in our future invest investments. One of the things I can tell you that as we work through it, um, we are looking at in our Verbun site that we are constructing in China, renewable energy, 100% from a partner. Electri as we are looking for electrification of our steam cracker furnace in Germany, we are working with partners, um, uh, Sabic and Linda. And that doesn't end only outside of Canada. It also is in Canada where we are forming partners. Yeah? Our partnership with Bullfrog Power, um, you heard the croak when BSF came up, uh, it's a, a, we source 50% uh, of our um, uh, for reduction of our emissions because we are part of the, we are purchasing power from Bullfrog, which is a community owned renewable energy project. And this is important, yeah, because we know that each part contributes to a carbon footprint. In BSF, we have also developed a product carbon footprint, which actually looks at how much carbon is in the product till it leaves our door. So which means we need to understand what is the carbon coming in at a product, at a product level from our suppliers and what is our carbon footprint at our production. So these, these things are important and this allows for a customer to also buy from us low carbon and challenge us to even lower, further lowering the carbon from our, carbon, from our products. Uh, this is important for disclosure, right? And that comes, uh, brings me to the third point around the disclosure part. We are actually working with Value Balancing Alliance, which is a organization that is founded as a nonprofit to help to standardize how companies are measuring and reporting their impact on their environment, economy, and society in monetary terms. We know that the carbon and reduction is absolutely important. And VBA is helping us meet that target in a financial term as well, so that we can get the right investments in the right KPIs in, ingrained. Most of the technologies, as I said, has been developing inside of BSF, but we see the partnership power. And for that, I think that's important. And we actually got recognized as well by the Global Compact Network in Canada for this partnership goals. And we have been winning awards there as well, because no single organization can do this alone. Thank you, Apollo. And after I, I'm going to go to Ave next, and I'm going to give you uh, each the chance to react to uh, or uh, or pick up on things that you might have heard uh, from each other. Uh, but one 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 uh, follow question to Apollo. So you mentioned um, I think the really key role of the creation of a 
um, internal market and a business to business market. I think there's hopefully lots of um, companies in the top 50 who are selling to each other, uh, as well as looking to um, 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 uh, uh, to export opportunities that might involve each other's products. Um, talk to us as the as the head of a Canadian operation of a global entity. Um, we know that one of the biggest uh, determinants of um, of uh, local um, uh, or Canadian national uh, economic growth is uh, the extent to which the, the 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 Canadian arm of a global company gets those key mandates, gets those mandates, uh, gets that capital investment to develop the new innovations. Um, you know, again, maybe take us a little bit into the boardroom here, but talk to us about what that's what that's like right now uh, in a global company with um, coming out of the pandemic and uh, lots of opportunities per, per, perhaps, but perhaps an unprecedented uh, um, um, kind of churn and uncertainty. Sure, um, thanks Karim. Uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, my, my role in, in BSF is to advocate for Canada in BSF and to advocate for BSF in Canada, right? So it goes both ways. Um, one of the things that we see is um, in Canada, the really um, upcoming strong public private partnerships that's forming around achieving these targets. And that to me is, is a great place uh, for me to advocate for uh, Canada inside of BSF. In terms of the, you know, there's always going to be competing priorities in terms of the market, in terms of the location, in terms of the ge geography, and in terms of the context. It's uh, B in BSF Canada is in a unique position because Canada offers certain things that no other country in the world actually provides. So, you know, I cannot go into the specific details, but we are working towards that and trying to leverage. And this is important, the foreign direct investment that we talk about, you know, BSF is a, is a foreign entity, but has, but understands that this is important for it to leverage the global power to make sure that the individual countries are developing in a way that is also not only becoming a market, a supplier, et cetera, but it's also a great employer for BSF. It actually enables us to have creative ideas across the way. That is, if you just focus, if you take BSF, SE, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, very German focused. Right now we are global focused. Our biggest Verbund site will be in China. One or two of our biggest investments in North America are in, in Geismar in Texas, but we don't anticipate that it's gonna just remain as that, right? So we anticipate certain things to happen in this regional ecosystems, and that's what we need to develop. And Canada is in a great place to have that ecosystem for North America. Thank you so much, Apala. Um, I wanna to go to uh, Ave Lethbridge at uh, uh, Toronto Hydro now. And um, climate change um, for a company like Toronto Hydro is not just a, a future uh, consideration, it's a current consideration. Um, um, I recall in my days in the Ontario government, the, uh, the, the needs that um, uh, uh, distribution companies would articulate around the needs, uh, around some of their capital reinvestment needs forced by uh, greater stresses on the on the system. So can you just talk to us, Ave, just about what the, at, at its most broad, what, what uh, the conversation is around climate uh, change and climate resilience within the company at the executive table right now? Of course, Kareem, thank you. I too wanna thank Corporate Knights for bringing such a terrific focus and attention to this over the last 20 years. Congratulations. Um, I wanna congratulate everyone here. It's an honor to be with, with everyone who has such a moral, and a sustainable investing commitment. Um, it's an honor. And Kareem, thank you to you at Ryerson for growing our leaders of the future because that is something Toronto Hydro is very interested in and we work very closely with the universities and colleges uh, to grow that future talent that we'll need to bring us forward in these strategies. Um, I, you asked a question earlier before I, get, I dive into the question you just asked. You said, you know, why, uh, you know, do we believe that, that uh, you know, why are we so interested in, in achieving net zero? Why isn't it imperative? And I don't think that's the question anymore. I think the question is how, when, how fast, what can we do together to partner to meet bold, bold action plans and bold targets? So, um, I've got myself and the teams thinking in those directions as opposed to why I think we're at a different different phase mm -hmm. in the world's view of this. The for for Toronto Hydro, um, really like 
to bring it down to systems and processes and measurements that we're looking at when you ask the question around some of the challenges i think for us one of the challenges is the conversion you know for, uh, from you know the natural gas to electrical and, and you know our capacity to serve ontario is a very clean electricity grid 93% emissions free but it presents us with an opportunity to switch away from the less clean energy sources uh, by electrifying, uh, you know, buildings and transportation, and we're very focused on these efforts. However, we have to really consider the capacity and our capacity. We have to continue to think about um, that capacity in in terms of the whole system and the whole grid. Um, you know, some estimated at being three times the current electricity supply. So this is a very important challenge for us, and we're very focused on it. It's going to take a lot of collaboration at all levels. Um, a partnership uh, and governments and willpower and incentives to drive, you know, the need forward. So it's a good problem to have. We've been over the last decade, we've invested nine billion in our distribution system. So to your question, Kareem, connecting the city of Toronto to on the Ontario bulk grid, grid which produces electricity that is 93% emission free, making it one of the world's uh, cleanest grids. Uh, as I mentioned before, but we've been really, uh, our attention's been on modernizing our grid to make more of a, you know, more resilient uh, to climate change and better able to handle higher volumes of renewable projects. So our ability to handle those projects is critical, but we've got to modernize that grid. So we've been really focused on that. So we puts us in a great position for the future. We continue to develop our disaster preparedness management programs. These are programs that are vital to us to enhance our ability to plan and operate during large scale emergencies and disasters. And we've all talked about that today and the obvious uh, situations that are happening, but we're all very used to ice storms, wind storms, floods. Um, by way of an example, in, Tron in 2020, Toronto Hydro responded to two extreme weather events, uh, wind storms, and one was a response to the Toronto Island if you're familiar with Toronto Island, um, uh, that we had a huge flood and an extremely intense situation and an extremely tough event that's posing an obvious, you know, dilemma for all of us. But to the to to the attribute of all of our employees um, and our, you know, very rigorous uh, disaster preparedness management program, we were able to manage our way through that, but we are also driving energy efficiency through large conservation, you know, and helping customers reduce energy consumption. We were very, very committed to all of this, but as you know, decisions change, um, but we must remain focused on conservation. Uh, obviously, we are working very closely with our own facilities to change and be a role model to doing it, but we must serve our community as well. One of the future plans that we're looking to, um, like many of you, um, our CEO Anthony Haynes has challenged us to target net zero by 2030 while supporting our city and our Toronto targets uh, for 2040 reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We're committed to you know, an exclusive procurement of EV vehicles. We have a very large fleet in the city 400 to 600 fleet of vehicles. We are really excited about partnering uh, in this space, both to support the city, but also to uh, change the way we operate. Uh, and as far as transportation across the city, we're partnering on over 70 solar generation projects with the city and EV charging pilots across the city, supporting solar and battery projects um, are very important for uh, alternatives in our uh, investment solutions and innovative solutions uh, like battery storage will help us manage peak demands uh, and lower costs. So we're really working to advance our pro environmental policies. A lot of work being done here. Our leaders are serving as board members of organizations to help advance uh, sound energy policies and solutions like plug and drive. And we're advancing our strategies, working um, closely with the city of Toronto to advance their, their very important strategies around transform TO goals. Uh, you know, things like retrofitting streetlights, increasing the chargers, 
uh, solar panels, the electrification of all our work centers are just some of the projects underway. Thank you, Avi. Um, great ambition there as shown by the other top 50 corporate citizens, citizen companies. And again, page 32 of your summer 2021 Corporate Nights Magazine to hear more, uh, learn more. We've got about four minutes left of this round table before we go to uh, Tom Dowdell. And um, just wanna get a sense, um, uh, any, are there any threads that any of the panelists wanna pick up before I put uh, a couple of more, um, more rapid questions? I just mentioned one. something that was that I was oh sure sure Nays uh, and then uh, and then Marcia uh, yeah sure okay I'll I'll, I'll be brief yeah. you know even around this table we have such a good representation of the kind of partnerships we need to think about ahead right like we have representation for manufacturing shipping how to decarbonize and improve the quality of the goods and services produced electricity is is obviously uh, very near and dear to all of our hearts and and deployment of capital financial institutions in the middle of the ecosystem making uh, it easy, uh, accessible, affordable to reach that capital uh, dollar. So uh, I think the world is going to need more and more of those kinds of partnership conversations between every organization and every le level of government to make this a reality. So that was a thread I was picking as we were uh, talking. Thank you, Nays. Marcia? Uh, no, I'll let you go ahead, given the time. Um, well, actually, there, it's, it's related to the, th the thread that Nays uh, picked up because um, what, there's also a public policy dimension to this, and uh, Kim had mentioned uh, green bonds and corporate nights, and the, um, the Council for Clean Capitalism was one of the first organizations that called on um, um, governments to create a, a green bond framework, and uh, Ontario took the lead within Canada um, in 2015 or 2016 on that. And so we're going to continue to see uh, the need for public policy to continue to drive uh, this this work. Um, there seems to be a broad consensus now in Canada on, on carbon pricing, but we know that's not the limit of the public policy um, 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 interventions that we'll need. Um, the, the role of OSFI has been mentioned. Um, maybe just rapid, rapid fire, what's the, what's the one public policy ask you? Minister Duclos is gonna come on in a few minutes and we'll table these with him. What's the one public policy ask that you would have of, let's say the federal government or, or provincial governments uh, that you're not seeing um, in effect just yet, but you know uh, it's gonna be part of the solution. Maybe start with Apala. Carbon credits. Carbon credits. Okay. Say more. So not just penalize for the with the carbon tax, but really if we are taking stuff out of the environment, okay. give us a credit as well. Right. Okay. So this way it's and it should be transferable so that we can actually do good, more good at scale. Mm -hmm. Kim. Yeah, I, I, that's, I don't want to comment on policy, but I, I would want to say engagement, um, engagement with the financial sector. And, and we're seeing that through our regulators. We're seeing that uh, through the new Sustainable Finance Action Council, just, just engagement from government. Okay, great. Uh, Ave? I really would like to see more incentives to encourage the right behaviors and conversion and electrification. Let's get really serious about it. Okay, great. Uh, Nays? I think I want to echo what Abe said, more incentives yeah. for the right behavior. Okay. And there's lots under that. Great. And we all await with, uh, we all await what the uh, net zero accelerator, uh, exactly uh, how that uh, uh, fund will uh, will roll out and um, uh, what, what funds it might leverage. Uh, Marcia? Um, well, I think that the federal government started down a path of supporting critical minerals. So when you think about um, products like copper and just to pick up on a couple of themes, you know, Apple talked about, we're all in this together and we have to work together. And, and Abby was talking about, you know, um, what we have to do in terms of infrastructure. And so um, products like copper are essential. We can't decarbonize the planet without it. And, you know, at our company, we're expanding and growing our copper production. And I think support from the federal government for critical minerals um, is going to be really key to our ability to decarbonize the planet. Great. Th thank you, Marcia. Some great, uh, some great uh, interventions there. Uh, the key role of partnerships, um, including partnerships that might exist in this room. Um, and I see Minister Duclos joining us, so we can get to him shortly as well. Um, in the Q and A, in the Q and A box, uh, there's been some uh, uh, further questions put, and uh, Apollo's discovered the answer live um, functionality. So I'd invite our other panelists, if they have time, in the next uh, ten minutes, to dive into those questions uh, that our uh, that some of our attendees are putting in. Uh, before we get to Mr. Duclos to, clo to close, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Tom Dowdle. 
uh, the business ambition for 1.5 degrees Celsius campaign lead at the Climate D Disclosure Project. The Climate Disclosure Project is a charity that runs the global disclosure system for organizations and regions to manage their environmental impacts. And four of the companies on the best 50 list this year have signed the business ambition for 1.5 commitment. Uh, 10 companies in total have joined. And again, back to the uh, intro video by Toby uh, and the mention of Greta Thunberg, um, we know, and the United Nations um, um, uh, uh, panel has told us that 1.5 is is the is the measure is the is the um, is the uh, threshold at which we have to gear our global carbon emission plans. And so, um, it's great that we have a representative with a group that is singularly focused on on that number and all the work that needs to get uh, done uh, by uh, the corporate sector around the world to to help achieve that. Um, and so, Dom, t Tom, do you want to talk to us a bit about the project and where Canada can fit into it? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everyone in Canada. Greetings from Amsterdam. So, yes, um, I coordinate the Business Ambition for 1.5 campaign from uh, Carbon Disclosure Project, but also on behalf of the Science Based Target Initiative. And essentially, the Business Ambition campaign was launched in 2019, really to um, prove that business was ready to step up to the level of setting 1.5 degree aligned science-based targets. And following through on that, I'm glad to say that uh, we have now uh, 624 companies in the campaign, all committed to uh, one of two things, either 1.5 degree aligned science-based targets or net zero targets by 2050 aligned with interim science-based targets. Um, that's an initiative, Science-Based Targets, is an initiative of uh, WWF, uh, World Resources Institute, the UN Global Compact, and uh, uh, CDP, also working with We Mean Business and the B Team. So it's a very cross-collaborative uh, project and campaign and really looking to uh, drive corporate leadership and prove that uh, businesses are ready to lead with 1.5 degree targets. We're also closely partnering with the UK government and the Race to Zero for COP26. There's really a huge push to get uh, a huge number of businesses ready and committed to 1.5 degree targets before COP26. And this is really now the largest group of companies committed to the gold standard of credible, externally verified science-based targets in line with what science says we need to do half global emissions and get to as close to zero as possible by 2050. It's been endorsed by the by the UN Secretary General Down and the UN High Level Champions, also the COP President Alok Sharma. And uh, I know that the UK government and the UK Canadian Embassy is definitely keen to recruit more Canadian companies to the campaign and to race to zero. So there's definitely an opportunity for companies to join and we would love to see that 10 increase uh, as far as possible. Great, Tom, thank you so much. And perhaps you could just dro drop into the general chat your uh, contact information and or the link um, because we have a, a number of Canadian companies here who uh, I think are recruitable in the last moments of our, our event here today. So please uh, do that. Great, that would be awesome. Uh, I will put okay. both <laughs> commitment letter and my contact details okay. and feel free to okay. reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, to close out this gala, we're uh, honored to have uh, the President of the Treasury Board of Canada coming off a very busy parliamentary session, coming off, um, uh, coming back from from uh, from some time away for health treatment. And we're so honored to have uh, someone who embodies the the values and the data based approach that we talked about at the beginning of the of the uh, of the of the gala. The Honorable Jean Yves Duclos, President of the Treasury Board of Canada. Uh, to uh, say a few words. Uh, when, welcome, Minister Duclos. Well, thank you very much, uh, Karim, for your kind and, and very generous uh, words. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning from uh, uh, the beautiful city of Quebec City, where I am now on the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat uh, Nation. And thank you, uh, Corporate Knights, for inviting me to attend your gala today. C'est évidemment un grand honneur pour moi d'être avec vous euh, aujourd'hui. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de me présenter comme président du Conseil du Trésor et donc euh, comme responsable du Conseil du Trésor. 
The Treasury Board, as you will know, most likely is a committee of federal cabinet ministers, including myself and the vice chair, Minister Joyce Murray, that oversees the spending, the regulations, the operation, the technology of the government of Canada, and is also responsible as principal employer of the core public servants. En fait, nous sommes euh, le conseil d'administration du gouvernement euh, du, Canada, du Canada. Et cette position que nous occupons est une position de grand privilège, mais ce privilège euh, s'accompagne évidemment de responsabilités importantes. And those responsibilities have been at the core of the particular challenges that we have felt and, and gone through during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been enduring COVID-19 and its impacts for some 15 months now. And one of its many effects has been to push our world, our economy, and our environment ahead in a number of different dimensions. The COVID-19 pandemic has created paradigm shifts. Uh, for example, as we all know, in the use of technology to bring us together, sometimes closer, in most cases virtually, and our concern, it also has brought us more concern for those who have been hit hardest by the pandemic, and also in our desire to build back better for a cleaner and more sustainable world. Nous nous trouvons aussi à un moment déterminant de la révolution verte. Nous savons que le seul choix pour le Canada est d'être à l'avant-garde de cette révolution. Nous avons aussi la volonté et les leviers d'intervention nécessaires pour créer les conditions favorables à l'atteinte de cet objectif. Les marchés publics sont l'un des plus puissants moyens pour y parvenir. The Government of Canada is the largest public purchaser of goods and services in the country, worth over $18 billion every year, and that purchasing power obviously has a lot of clout. We're also the biggest landlord in the country. We own 30,000 buildings, 20,000 infrastructure assets, and 30,000 vehicles. So we have a responsibility to show leadership and manage our assets in a way that achieves green and climate resilient outcomes. Et c'est pourquoi le gouvernement, par son budget de 2021, propose de consacrer 17,6 milliards de dollars à la relance verte afin de créer des emplois, de bâtir une économie propre et de lutter contre les changements climatiques. Et si nous demandons aux Canadiens de prendre des mesures en ce qui concerne les changements climatiques dans leur quotidien, nous devons aussi écologiser nos propres activités au sein du gouvernement canadien. Our updated greening government strategy outlines how we'll do this. By building zero carbon and climate resilient buildings, by buying electric vehicles, clean electricity, low carbon fuels, and low carbon construction materials, and by adopting clean technologies, products, and services across all categories of goods and services. Notre objectif global est de parvenir à des émissions nettes nulles d'ici 2050, incluant notamment une cible provisoire de réduction de 40 d'ici 2025, pour les installations et le parc, le parc de véhicules ordinaires du gouvernement canadien. Et nous sommes en très bonne voie d'y arriver. À la fin de l'exercice 2019-2020, nos ministères et organismes avaient réduit collectivement les gaz à effet de serre émis par les immeubles et les véhicules ordinaires de près de 35 depuis 2005. Budget 2021 also includes $93 million for clean electricity for government operations and $228 million for low carbon fuels for our aircraft and ships. And, ships. and by using clean electricity and cleaner fuels, we're not only leading by example, we're also using our purchasing power to encourage innovation to find new, cleaner energy sources. This also provides businesses and leaders such as you with a great opportunity to work with our government and respond to our objectives of strong and sustainable development. Now, I'd like to add that we're also using public procurement to contribute to a more inclusive economy by empowering historically disadvantaged 
entrepreneurs, and supporting small businesses. To that end, budget 2021 earmarks $87 million over five years, starting this year, for public services and procurement Canada to modernize federal procurement and create more inclusive procurement opportunities. Among other things, this investment will assist black owned businesses to uh, support the procurement needs of the government of Canada. We we'll continue to travail to attain the objective of Canada to attribute au minimum 5% of the contracts federal to entreprises gérées and dirigées by the autochtones, as well as integrate the considerations relative to accessibility in the market federal, which will make sure that the goods and services will be accessible to people with functional limitations. In conclusion, Karim and everyone, uh, public procurement is more than just purchasing goods and services. It's also about leading by leveraging our buying power to initiate change and innovation and create a new green economy that will, that will bring new opportunities. It's also about lifting people by supporting small businesses and businesses led by marginalized Canadians. Canadians that are over, underrepresented in the benefits and contributions that procurement can bring, such as indigenous peoples, black and racialized Canadians, women, LGBTQ2 Canadians, and other underrepresented groups. Il s'agit donc de construire des sociétés et un Canada plus fort, plus résilient, plus vert, et d'aider à créer un monde meilleur. Now, I would like to end by saying that this can all only be done with your leadership and your work and by sharing our continuing and commit and vision and commitment to do that uh, together. Thank you very much, uh, Karim and everyone else. And uh, merci à l'avance pour tout ce que vous allez faire au cours des prochaines années pour bâtir votre partenariat avec le gouvernement canadien. Thank you so much, Minister Duclos. Thank you for playing that key role uh, at the the internal uh, side of government that is driving so much change outside of government uh, and in partnership with others. Um, as Diane Sachs said in the chat, uh, the key is to do more faster. And I'm glad that we have um, uh, seven or eight institutions uh, on the front lines of that uh, and their leaders who have represented uh, that work today. Uh, David from Hitro Quebec, uh, Marcia from Tech, Kim from HSBC, Nays from Van City, um, uh, Apala from um, um, BASF um, and uh, Ave from T Toronto Hydro, as well as T Tom from the Climate Disclosure Project and Minister du Duclos uh, with the Government of Canada driving change uh, at the national level. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for joining us today. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, Bullfrog Power. Uh, thanks to Corporate Knights and the Corporate Knights team uh, for putting uh, this event on. Um, you might hear the gribbit of the Bullfrog Power one more time on the way out. Um, and again, just a, a key reminder through this conversation of how interdependent we are, uh, whether it's the climate challenge, whether it's the uh, other challenges uh, for justice and recognition uh, that people are talking about uh, today and which uh, your companies, your institutions are on the front lines are on. Uh, we need uh, your participation um, in this uh, new world to build the kind of Canada that uh, Minister Duclos spoke about uh, in partnership and hopefully be a beacon to the world. So uh, on behalf of Corporate Knights and the Corporate Knights team and Toby Heaps, who uh, we'll be sharing this recording with, um, thank you so much uh, for your participation today and have a great, um, have a great the rest of your day.